everyone. I'm Alex Samuel, the Executive Director of MIT Sol. We're here today as part of Solve at MIT, um, and I have two very special guests with me. Uh, Sergei Panocki is the Mikhail Kureshevsky Professor of Ukrainian History at the and the Director of the Ukrainian Re Research Institute at Harvard University. Yuval Noah Harari is a historian, philosopher, and the best-selling author of Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind, and we're so delighted to have uh, you both here today. So let's start with a question that I think is on everyone's mind at the moment, um, and which is around uh, Ukraine. And here at uh, MIT Solve, our mission is to drive innovation, solve world challenges, and find and fund social entrepreneurs all around the world. Um, but I think it's really important as we think about technology, innovation, social impact, to ground ourselves in history and its lessons. And that's why we've both invited you today as two uh, wonderful mm -hmm. historians. Um, and so thinking about Ukraine, uh, those of us who are old enough to remember the fall of the Berlin Wall, so at the end of the Soviet Union, um, back in the day, we all thought this was the end of history. Um, and that the liberal, capitalist, and democratic models had won out, um, and that we could solve all problems, that we could solve, uh, eliminate poverty, hunger, disease, that technology would be uh, there to really help us. Uh, but really, my first question is, was the last 20, 30, 40 years a period of anomaly? Um, is, is this war changing things? So if I can go first, I would say that it depends on us. It doesn't have to be an anomaly. I mean, if you look at the last 40 years, say, compared to most previous eras in recorded history, then yes, it was the most, by many measurements, it was the most peaceful era in human history. I know there are still wars in parts of the world even in the last 40 years. I live in the Middle East, I'm completely aware of it. But still, if you look I mean, since 1945, not a single internationally recognized country was wiped off the map by external invasion and, and foreign conquest, which was the norm previously. You know, for the first time in history, more people die from suicide than from human violence. That, that's an, an, an amazing achievement. And I am, the best thing maybe is to look at, 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 at military defense budgets, at, def at, at military budgets, uh, for most of history, all these emperors and khans and caliphs and kings, they spent most of their budget on their military. In recent decades, the average military budget of, of governments around the whole world is about 6.5%. And in Europe, less than 3%. Most of the money goes to healthcare, education, welfare, things like that. This is an anomaly in human history. But uh, it didn't result from some freak changes in the laws of nature. It resulted from humans making good decisions, building good institutions, and we can maintain this. We can continue to make good decisions and, and build good institutions. Or uh, if, if Putin wins in his endeavor, more and more of the world would look like uh, what's happening around Ukraine and, and would look like Russia. I mean, nobody knows what the military budget of Russia is, because it's a secret, but estimates are around 20%. This is how we, a relatively poor country like Russia built this military machine. If Putin is allowed to win, we will see defense budgets all over the world skyrocket, and at the expense of things like education and healthcare. And it's a choice in which kind of, of world do we want to live? Uh, yes, I, I, I agree with uh, what has been said, and it is an anomaly, but uh, it's up to us uh, to uh, turn it maybe into a new norm. And uh, mm. today we are at the point where really um, uh, a lot of things will be decided for the next maybe 10 years, 20 years, or even more. Exactly, a lot depends on the way how this war goes and more specifically whether the aggression will be stopped. Because uh, since the end of World War II, since 1945, there was also no, at least in Europe, there was no annexation of territory by one state, territory of another. And it happened in 2014 with the, with the Crimea. 
Uh, uh, so we are back not just to 1989 or to 1991 when allegedly history ended or at least the, the, the liberal era was supposed to arrive. But we are going back to the period of 1939, the, before the start of World War II. There were comparisons made between, of course, Anschluss and the annexation of the Crimea, and th there can be more comparisons of that kind provided. In terms of technology, to a degree, this, this new world is exactly as you all said, is the result of the uh, wise decisions made by the politicians and, and the electorates, at least in democratic countries, making good choices as well. But it is also the result of the, of the fear of the nuclear annihilation. Because 1945, that's, that's the time when the nuclear age started when the world saw the destructive power of nuclear weapons. And uh, some people uh, here in the US who worked on that bomb actually wanted the bomb to be exploded because they wanted to scare the world. They wanted the world to know what kind of enormous power the governments would have from now on. And today we are in an age where there is a cavalier attitude toward nuclear weapons. There are much more uh, drivers on the nuclear highway than there was back in 1945, 1962, or 1989. And that is, that is a major challenge, how, again, to turn technology to serve us as opposed to allow that technology to destroy us. I'll just add to that that um, many people who, who develop or are at the, the uh, cutting edge of developing technology today, they sometimes see technology as being above history, as being free from history, or able to just shape history any, any way it likes, and, it, and it's not the case. Technology is always not just developed, but used in a particular context, in a particular historical context. History doesn't end, it doesn't go away. And you know, when you develop a technology, a good exercise is to think about the politician you most fear in the world and to think what he or she will do with the technology I'm developing. Not only about the best case, what, not only what you are thinking of doing with your technology, also what they are going to do with the technology. And also, again, in history is, is, is usually, the, never, moves in a, in a straight, simple line. You know, people expected this war to be this kind of cyber warfare with, I don't know, uh, 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 special forces jumping out of the screens and, and whatever. And in the end, we do have cyber warfare and we do have very new phenomena. Like people, you know, in the Spanish Civil War, you wanted to, to, to join the international brigades, you had to go to Spain. Now you can sit in San Francisco and join the international cyber brigades and help fight the war. But having said that, the, the war itself, it looks so much like the, old war, like the old world. And you know, Molotov cocktails and not cyber we weapons have been far more predominant. And it's just not just in Ukraine. You know, in, in California, people have all, have all these dreams about uh, 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 a new uh, uh, virtual world and all these wonderful technologies, but one of the biggest political projects, at least in terms of the attention it got, in Southern California and the whole of the Southern United States was building a stone wall. This is Neolithic technology. And so you have the Neolithic age and the digital age side by side. We don't leave it behind. It, it, it always goes together. Absolutely. Just, just uh, uh, one, one thing to add to that. Already in Ukraine, they talk about this war as a 19th century war that is very often fought with 21st century weapons. And the, 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 there is just this bridge between 19th and 20th century in, in one place in one time. I want to rebound, I think, on one of your uh, comments, Yuval, about uh, and a good advice for our MIT uh, and sort of audiences about as you design technology, thinking about the worst politician and thinking about how they might use that technology. Um, I think that's really good advice for, for our MIT and solve audiences. Um, and I want to expand, if that's OK, from, um, from the conflict of Ukraine and this current geopolitical era 
to think about, to dive a, a little deeper in this, this piece about technology. And indeed, I think that the history of humanity is also the history of technology and technological development. And, you know, I'm an optimist and I like to think that overall, the technological progress leads to human progress and leads to good things. Um, but there's definitely technology also causes and has caused throughout history existential threats. Um, today, I think, so, or at least personally, the ones that I see are around increasing inequality all around the world, uh, driven by automation and AI, nuclear disaster, which we already talked about and started referencing, and of course, uh, climate change. So I'd like to dive a little bit deeper into, um, into some of these topics if we have time. Um, mm -hmm. And as regards inequality, um, you know, there's sort of the centralization of power and resources has been throughout history yet again, um, a way that empires function. And today we see continued and increasing inequality and concentration of power in a few people uh, and a few corporations. And, you know, that's, mm -hmm. that seems uh, similar to the golden, uh, the Gilded Age. And so, um, mm. and so I'd love to think about is there parallels between these two eras and how do we extrapolate the lessons around inequality from the past to think about how technology, instead of exacerbating inequality in some cases, may in fact uh, reverse that or advance opportunities for all? The parallel with the Gilded Age is, is really a very, very productive one. And again, this is, this is a parallel about this growth and equality and concentration of resources and money in the hands of very few. But I would say that we are in a worse place now than we were during the Gilded Age, so the last decades of the 19th century. Because during the last decades of the 19th century, you saw also the growth of the real wages by 60% uh, in, in the last decades of the 19th century. I don't think that we're actually doing as well now. So the situation is, mm. is, 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 is worse than it was uh, during the Gilded Age. Uh, the question is uh, whether, whether development of technology is uh, responsible for that. To a degree, yes. Technology is very often responsible for good things, for bad things, for, for the best of the things and for the worst of the things. It's, it all depends on the society. It depends on what we do with that technology. And technology that we have today and that we have now, it seems to me provides uh, the opportunities for the uh, countries that otherwise would be maybe poor, would not be competing with the major powers or the imperial powers. Uh, compete. And that's, that's especially mm. true, it seems to me, for IT. And look where the, the main hubs, or IT hubs now today. Some of them are really in the, in the so-called developed world, but others are in the world that is developing and sometimes lacks other resources. So it is not the Gilded Age of the 19th century where, when you really needed an iron ore and you needed coal and mm. things like that to participate in the world exchange. Now what you need uh, is uh, uh, brains, brains and education. So, but this is, this is uh, the, the technology gives us opportunity to be better than we are today and, and not, <laughs> not as bad as we are again, uh, looking back at the, uh, turn of the 20th century, we were in a better shape then. Ah, I think that I completely agree that on the one hand now, you can have a high-tech hub anywhere. You basically need knowledge. You need human capital, you need brains. You don't need steel and, and, and coal and so forth. The other side of the coin is that it also makes it much easier to concentrate all the power and wealth in just one place. For much of history, we always saw these inequalities, but you know, when the main economic asset was land, you just can't concentrate all the land in one place. It's, it's, it's a physical impossibility. Also in the industrial age, when factories and machines and coal and steel and all that, they became the main economic asset, still, you couldn't concentrate all the production in one place. It was a physical impossibility. So you couldn't move all the production just to Britain or just to Japan. Now, with the new digital economy, the main assets 
are on the one hand the knowledge of, 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 of professionals, and on the other hand, it's data and it's computing power. And the thing is, you can concentrate all of them in one place. You can concentrate all the data of the world and all or most of the computing power of the world in just one place or a few places. And the more the economy depends on these resources, if we don't take counter actions, we might see the creation of the most unequal economy and therefore unequal system that, that, that ever existed. You know, it's not just where you develop things like artificial intelligence. It's also things even like the textile industry. Now in the textile industry, the most important thing is not the cotton fields, and it's not the, the factories, it's the data. It's the data about what the consumers want, about the latest fashions. So we can see that even in a very traditional industry like textile, we might reach a point when all the key data is in the hands of just one or two companies, let's say Amazon and Alibaba, and that's it. So that's a very big danger we need to, to take into account, which never existed before. And it demands active, I mean, if we just leave it to itself, it tends to grow even more extreme. Data comes to data and wealth com comes to wealth. So to make sure that countries like Ukraine, like Egypt, like Sri Lanka, which is now really collapsing, would still be in the game, uh, we need some kind of global safety net and a better distribution of the dividends, of the profits of the, of, of the current technological revolution between the whole of humanity and not allow them to be concentrated in just a handful of countries. I want to move on, if, uh, if that's okay, a little bit looking forward to, to the future and, and hopefully mm -hmm. some hopes uh, and advice for our community of technologists and innovators who are devoted to social change. This idea of uh, sort of even looking more broadly than uh, than than Europe and and the U.S., um, but looking to uh, to communities across the world who who may not have access to to many opportunities right now, and how refugees across the world uh, and people who are still living uh, under two dollars a day and different underserved communities, how can uh, we think about uh, bridging this moral distance uh, and think about the futures uh, for the most vulnerable among us uh, and how do we use design technology um, to, to, help, um, to help these people? One thing should be very clear is that the people who design the technology have enormous power to shape and reshape the world and um, that they have choices you can design many different types of technologies, not just one, it's never deterministic. So for instance, you can as an engineer, as an entrepreneur, create a technological tool for a government to survey, monitor citizens, or you can create the opposite tool for citizens to monitor the government. Uh, I, I, I uh, grew up and I was educated in the Soviet Union, so the, the only philosophy that was there readily available and we were forced to study it, it was Marxism. And the, the, one of the foundational things about this variety of Marxism that I studied was that there is uh, development of technology and automatically it gets transformed into the social change and social change eventually trans gets transformed into the political change. So stages in the development of the, of the society and they're driven by, by uh, technological development. Um, I, I didn't like that idea at the time because just it was forced on us. But uh, I, I also, uh, as, as, as I, started to, to be exposed to different, to different philosophies and, and, and studied history, I realized that this is, there is nothing automatic about that. I also lived through the fall of the Soviet Union and everyone believed that the um, end of history will come also with the help of technology because authoritarian regimes 
can't really survive if there are computers and, and then access to the internet and so on and so forth. And we see today that they actually not just survived, they're doing, they doing very well. So the question is, what do we do with the technology that we develop or you develop? And the social responsibility of, 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 a, of a scientist, of a scholar, of an engineer, and you can use the car to do all sorts of things, both positive and, and, and negative. And the, the, the issue is that uh, in, in terms of social responsibility, it seems to me that the key is that the work of the, of the inventor, of the engineer, of scientist doesn't really end with the product being ready. To a degree, mm -hmm. some very important part of that work only starts to make the world aware about that, to make sure that this particular tool, that this particular algorithm is used in the way how it was intended by the creators. So three basic rules are that my data should be used to help me and not manipulate me. That's, that's a very old rule. I mean, doctors know it. So it should also apply to IT. Secondly, that we should never allow all the data to be concentrated in one place. This is the kind of high road to dictatorship and to economic monopoly as well. And finally, that whenever you increase surveillance, top-down surveillance, we must simultaneously increase bottom-up surveillance. So if we have a new technology that makes it easier for governments and corporations to follow us and monitor us and collect data on us, that's fine. And, uh, and when we balance it with technology that makes it easier for customers and citizens to monitor the corporations and the governments at the same time. And this is really good advice that as innovators of technolo and technologists, we have a responsibility uh, around social impact and ethics. Um, but that also we can, and I think we're doing this through Solve, we're as much as possible opening the doors so that more and more people all around the world can be innovators themselves and can connect to technology um, and also think about uh, ancestral technology and bring back some of the technologies that have been uh, proved to be sustainable throughout millennia. Um, mm. But uh, we're at time, so I wanted to thank you both um, for this great conversation. Thank, Thank you so you. much to you both. Thank you. Thank you.